Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me uh, back uh, with the group. Um, <clears throat> for those who haven't met him, Ryan Price, I'm the Chief Economist here at Virginia Realtors. And uh, today we got a lot of information to cover uh, on this uh, March Madness uh, data edition. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan, I just muted you as I was muting people as they come in. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes, sorry. All right, great. Yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of new information coming in. Um, you know, we had the Federal Reserve meeting that happened this week, and we're going to talk through some of the key takeaways from that and sort of where we are with the economy overall, because the economy, health of the economy or lack of health really does impact the uh, the housing market. And right now, uh, most signs are pointing to a strong economy, uh, but uh, sort of moderating as we progress through the year. But we're going to talk through that. And then importantly, going to spend a lot of time on the housing market, on your housing market specifically, the uh, the far housing market. Um, very, uh, you know, very tight market, as I'm sure you all are feeling every single day. But we'll talk through what the data trends are showing us. Uh, so far that, you know, we had data through uh, February. So we'll take a look at how this year so far is stacking up to other years uh, that we've had. So we'll kick it off by diving into the latest uh, information on the economy. Now, our economy has been quite resilient uh, over the course of really last year, I think, is what caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, you know, a year ago, there was a lot of chatter about um, a lot of modeling <clears throat> about a recession occurring, you know, towards the end of 2023. And that just did not occur at all. Uh, we had actually, you know, upwards of 5% growth to our overall economy, which is measured by this GDP gross domestic product. And uh, that teal line there you can see is really the represents the change in our economy compared to the prior year. So anything above that, that uh, zero, the black line there, represents a growing economy. Anything below it means a contracting economy. And, uh, you know, as recent as Q4, which covers, you know, October, November, December, 3.2% uh, growth, which is uh, quite strong, uh, considering where we are with inflation and with interest rates. And uh, it's projected that this could slow down a little bit. You can see those there's other lines there and uh, on the yellow part of the slide, there is an expectation that <clears throat> those, uh, you know, those interest rates that have been, uh, the Fed has been hiking, it takes a while for that, uh, those actions to really filter its way through the economy and affect uh, business decisions and consumer decisions. But uh, right now it's looking, you know, we're not seeing evidence that we're going to have a big drop off in economic activity. Now that could certainly change on a dime, but um, <clears throat> the metrics that we have now are, are showing kind of slower growth, but still growing as we progress through 2024. And the Fed actually upgraded their projection. They they do their own projections. And uh, just yesterday, they upgraded their projection for GDP to be stronger this year than they previously had thought it would be. Now, one of the reasons why we're we're seeing this resiliency, this strength in the economy overall is because consumers are feeling better about it, about the economy than they did a year ago. And this is measured by consumer sentiment, which is a survey that has been produced, you know, since the 1950s on uh, that measures consumers perceptions. It's not, you know, I spent this much money in the economy this month or I'm planning to spend this much next month, it's what is your perception? How are you feeling about it? What is your expectation about it? And, uh, you know, you can see kind of starting in the the end of 2023, really November through January, we did see a pretty big increase in consumer sentiment. Now we're, as you can see, we're not near where we were sort of 2018, 19 uh, levels, but compared to where we were, you know, in 2022 and uh, 2023, we're on the upward upswing uh, for consumer sentiment. And I think a lot of this is being driven by the fact that we have seen we have seen improvement in inflation. And uh, that's that's going to help people to feel better about, um, 
spending money. Now, that's not to say that there's still a bit of sticker shock, you know, when we go to the grocery store, when we're out uh, purchasing goods and services. But compared to where it was, it certainly has improved. And that's reflected in this consumer sentiment. Now, another thing that has uh, probably gone into this increased uh, sentiment of a positive sentiment is that our wages have uh, continued to grow. I mean, they're still growing at about 5%. You know, if you look backwards in time there, 2016, 17, really, if you go back to kind of 2013, it's not, I didn't have room on this chart, but kind of flat, really flat wage growth. And then we saw kind of a big jump up there in 2022 uh, due to the fact that, you know, firms were couldn't fill positions. They were just, uh, there were not enough workers for the amount of jobs that were needed. And so this put upward pressure on wages, which has continued. And so as people are making more money and as inflation has gone down, which you can see in this black line, uh, what that does is it increases the purchasing power. Now, it's not that, uh, you know, we're, like I said, on the, the last slide, we're still feeling the effects of that inflation. It's still too, it's still too high. It's still above target. And we're going to walk through that in a minute. But the fact that the the wages are going faster than inflation uh, points to positive consumer sentiment and the positive consumer sentiment uh, produces, you guessed it, consumer spending. Uh, we uh, are spending, we continue to spend our money in the economy, which is, uh, you know, is one of the reasons why the, the GDP numbers have been so resilient. And we're buying, you know, not just one item, we're buying goods, expensive items, as well as services. We're going out to restaurants, we're still traveling, we're still buying automobiles, you know, if you can find them. Uh, it's, uh, so this has been pretty, I mean, I think a pretty big story in 2023 was the fact that consumer spending, you know, remained as strong as it did. Now, we've gotten some early subtle signs that it could be pulling back a little bit. And, you know, we've, I think we've talked about this in previous um, meetings, presentations, but, you know, people are sort of burning through their, their COVID era savings. There's a lot of stimulus money. There was a lot of, uh, you know, during the lockdowns when people were not spending money on the, in, on eating out or doing anything or travel, there was a accumulation of savings, uh, in excess of, uh, $2 trillion is what I saw up there. And so that's being spent, uh, and it's, basically almost gone at this point, uh, the excess savings. But because wages are up, because inflation's down, people continue to spend more money on uh, on things in the economy. Now, what this is doing is it's propelling the job market as well. Uh, so companies continue to hire. And uh, the latest data we have at the national level, the jobs, the jobs market uh, or the jobs reports continue to exceed the expectations. It's, uh, you know, 275,000 additional jobs at the net additional jobs in February. Uh, the expectation was it was going to be about 200,000. It blew right through that. Uh, we'll see what happens in March, but similar uh, situation here in, in the Commonwealth. You know, we just uh, January, so there's a little bit of a lag there, but January we get uh, is the most recent state level. So this is a state level data, 8,000 700 approximately additional jobs in Virginia. Now, what are those jobs? We're talking, I mean, it's across the board, but most of our growth in in uh, recent months, or actually for much of the last year um, and into this year, much most of our growth has been in the professional business uh, services sector, which are a lot of your government contractors that are, you know, in your region, there's a ton of, ton of government contractors uh, and, uh, you know, military um, businesses. And then there's, you know, a lot of office jobs down in, uh, in Richmond related to the state government. So a lot of private sector jobs are in this category. And these are really your homeowners, you know, tend to be your homeowners uh, because the wages tend to be a little bit higher in those sectors. Another sector that's been growing and it's probably reflected in this 8,700 are healthcare. Healthcare jobs have been growing uh, relatively quickly and also transportation and warehousing. So this is really related to e-commerce, the growth of e-commerce and online spending and the jobs associated with those types of activities, whether it be deliveries, whether it be logistics, uh, a lot of engineering and kind of uh, uh, warehouse uh, manufacturing type of stuff. So 
those are the main job sectors, but it's really across across the board, hmm. uh, this growth in, in Virginia's jobs. When we look at the overall job job market, one measure that's important to look at and the Fed keeps an eye on is the number of openings. So these are unfilled jobs. And right now, you know, we have above 9 million. Um, and if you were to kind of give that a little context, it's about one job, uh, 1.4 jobs per worker um, that's looking for a job. So that means that, you know, it's really favorable to uh, employees or job seekers. And because this this level is so high, it's it points to the fact that the the economy is still uh, in a position where businesses want more employees. Uh, it, it you know it's it's not the converse of that, which is they're just shedding jobs. You know they're cutting jobs or they're you know eliminating jobs that they had vacant, and they're just like you know what maybe we can do without that position. Uh, and now it ha you can see it's gone down. You know we were approaching we were above uh, two jobs per per worker there for a while, so it has it has gone down a little bit, but it's still above one job per worker, so it's still considered to be a tight labor market. And as such, our unemployment rate continues to hover very, very low. 3% in Virginia is extremely low unemployment. If folks are out there looking for jobs, the, the reality is they do have a lot of options, um, you know, at the macro level, you know, it, it's all individual uh, case by case, but uh, the unemployment rate continues to be low and, you know, it might edge up a little bit over the course of the year, but I'm not seeing any any signs that this is any concerning signs with the unemployment rate, both nationally as well as here in Virginia. So that, uh, you know, the inflation data, it's looking much better than it did, you know, just a year ago or even two years ago, it peaked, you know, about 9%. And so this is measuring, what this is measuring is the cost of goods and services compared to a year ago. So the black line, for example, it takes everything, uh, all, all types of goods and services, everything really, and uh, energy, uh, shelter, and it's 3.2%. So these things cost 3.2% more than they did last year. And if you take out some of the items that are volatile, things that, that the prices change daily uh, and fluctuate, Things like the gas, you know, the gas prices can change a lot, and that's energy. Uh, food tends to to change a bit. So you take those items out, and you get this thing called core CPI, consumer price index, and that is really a more, I think, uh, accurate gauge of where inflation is sitting. And so it, it's a bit higher. It has been trending down pretty steadily, but it, we're kind of at this. We've kind of plateaued a little bit with the inflation, and there's even some data out there, a different index. Uh, I didn't put a slide in there on that, but I don't think I did. No. Uh, the PCE index, which is a different index, but that that has shown actually a little bit of upward pressure, uh, very subtle, but a little bit of upward pressure on, on pricing, on inflation, upward inflationary pressure. So we are heading in the right direction, but we're kind of at this wait and see moment. Uh, to see if it's going to continue to march downward or if it might start to to pick up a little bit. And this is sort of why the Federal Reserve is in this sort of wait, wait it out or not, uh, you know, kind of continue to monitor, I, I think is how I would put it. Uh, they're not really waiting. They're just they're monitoring the information that's coming in. And so they met this week and they did not increase or sorry, decrease. They did not decrease the federal funds rate, which is shown here in the, the pink line. Back in December, November, December of last year, uh, the market was expecting a, a cut uh, to this rate in, in March. And since that time, uh, you know, more data has come out and we've seen it in our previous slides here. The job market is still rather hot. Um, there's still, you know, low un unemployment. We're still spending. The GDP is still on the rise. So really not any signs that the economy is slowing uh, to the point where they would want to cut this rate, because if they cut it too soon, they run the risk of 
re uh, reanimating or re energizing inflation uh, because people would be spending more money. Businesses would be spending more money because what this rate is doing is it basically influences the cost of borrowing across the economy. It's uh, indirectly tied to every type of borrowing, uh, you know, loan type of product out there, whether it be a business loan, <laughs> or a credit card or an auto loan, indirectly mortgages. And we're going to talk through that in a minute. But right now they're holding. They've been holding since July. Uh, right now it's starting to look likely they could cut it in uh, June or later this summer. There's another meeting in July. And um, they've uh, announced they're anticipating three uh, rate cuts at a quarter uh, percentage point each time. So starting to see this dial back a little bit in 2023, but not as fast as folks were hoping and, and probably not as deep of a cut as people were hoping uh, because of the resiliency of the economy. They're really, you don't want to overheat, uh, overheat the economy again, uh, which is what happened when they cut it to zero, uh, which you can see there in 2020. Let's pivot now to the housing market. We, uh, you know, like I said, we only have data through February. So we're still kind of feeling out this 2024 market a bit. Uh, but you really, there, the trends and sort of the factors that are influencing the market have not changed. Um, and one of the biggest is interest rates. So interest rates, now they have improved a little bit uh, from last Actually, I should say a little bit more, not just a little bit. They improved considerably since October when they were almost 8%. Now, we're talking 30-year fix. We're talking this is an average rate. We all know it really depends on the borrower qualifications and a lot of other factors. But when you average it out, you know, six and three quarters is basically where, where we are. Now, we're going to get a fresh batch of data this afternoon on the interest rate. So we'll see where it's going. But uh, quite a bit of improvement from that almost 8% there just a few months ago. and But the reality is if you keep pulling your eyes backwards and don't go too far back to the left because you'll get depressed. Uh, but you can see there, you know, we're still kind of coming out of that doubling of the interest rate that occurred in less than one year. And so there's still a bit of sticker shock. There's still a bit of recalibration that's kind of working its way through uh you know the buyers and the potential you know move up buyers the sellers that are out there looking at these homes and looking at their monthly payment and trying to figure out what to do so we've gotten through you know almost a year or more of rates you know above six percent so it's this term is overused way too much but kind of new normal is sort of where we're looking at these rates, you know, just people becoming more comfortable with them. And the way you get comfortable with them is, you know, you adjust your budget or you adjust your search criteria or, you know, you sort of uh, change your your lens that you're looking uh, at the housing market and not unusual to have a rate this high. You know, I, you know, you talk to anybody who's been in the, the business for a while, uh, you know, this is not really abnormally high, but it certainly feels abnormally high if if you've been in the market only uh, even a decade, uh, it does feel feel quite high. So these are expected to uh, be volatile um, over the next uh, year or so. And so when we're talking about the housing market, I, I, I'm starting with interest rates because really there's two things right now that are um, influencing the market the most, and that's the interest rates and the inventory. And so we're going to talk about those two first. Back to the interest rates, though, one thing that, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit hopeful for is that we're going to have the situation where the the lock in effect, as it's been termed, where the sellers, the homeowners, I should say, the homeowners are sitting on very, very low interest rates and are hesitating to to lose those by buying a new home. The lock in effect is probably going to start to loosen up a little bit as that gap between the black line, which is the market rate for a 30 year fixed and the orange or kind of brownish line there, which is what homeowners have on their mortgages in Virginia. As that gap narrows, which it is expected to do based on 
several forecasts that we've been keeping an eye on, as well as our own forecasts, then it could um, entice some some homeowners to list their homes and and enter the market. And there is a bit of pent up demand in that uh, kind of uh, move up buyer segment of the the market. So keep we'll keep an eye on it. But you know, as that gap narrows, then the the fear or the hesitation to uh, lose your interest rate. Uh, softens. And consumers uh, are feeling more optimistic about mortgage rates. And this is important because the the perception is is so important uh, when, you know, when you're looking at making such a big purchase like this and like a home. And so the green line represents, this is put out by Fannie Mae every month. Green line represents the expectation um, that rates are going to go down and the red line is that they're going to go up. Uh, and you can see a very big pivot in both directions uh, right around November. Because basically in November uh, is where we went on this 12-week um, <laughs> kind of a, you know, just a, a march downward of interest rates. Uh, you know, they went from about 8%, 12 straight weeks, they were just... I don't want to say tumble, but they were they were lowering every week. It was just like they're going lower, 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 lower. And that influences people's perceptions and sentiments. So we've seen improvement or more optimism about mortgage rates uh, that for the remaining uh, part of 2024, which is, again, it's going to influence people's housing decisions. Now, our data through February, sorry, there we go. Uh, you can see there really has not been any noticeable improvements in inventory. Uh, we're still very low. I mean, it's up a little bit, but nowhere near where it was, nowhere near what we need. Uh, similar conditions there. This is statewide, by the way. We got 15,000 active listings there. It's a point in time. Uh, so yeah, this is going to jump around. It's a end of February. Uh, but, you know... It's actually gotten tighter in your market. Now, this again, this is a point in time. So if you were to look on the market on February 29th, leap day, <laughs> that's how many listings are out there. And yeah, lower than last year, hasn't really improved. So uh, it's still, the inventory continues to be constrained, which is a, putting a lot of upper pressure on home pricing, which we're going to talk about. And it's also constraining the number of sales that could occur uh, just because there's just not a lot of homes to have a transaction. And we're seeing buyers and sellers slow to enter the market so far. Now, this is year to date. And we're like we said, we only have two months of data. So we'll, you know, we'll see how this starts to play out. But so far, buyers are are still, you know, hesitating. Our pending sales numbers are down from where they were last year and way down from, you know, from prior years there. Uh, that's the pink, or sorry, the purple represents the pending new pending sales, new contracts. This is statewide. No, I'm sorry. This is this is Fredericksburg uh, market. This is your your footprint. And then on the seller side of the table, new listings are down as well, or sorry, up a little bit, but much lower than kind of a typical where we would be through February. You know, when we look at other other years, uh, kind of the start of other years, uh, those markets were still way below that trend line. Now, what this is doing, you know, we are seeing a little bit more more uh, supply, but th that's really this calculation is is a rolling average of sales divided by the number of listings. And so, anytime you have a situation where your sales activity is slowing down. Yeah, fewer sales, a little bit more inventory, you're going to see that supply number go up. And we've seen it go up by about a half a month, really, in the state. Now, this is, you know, as of February, we have about two months. Um, healthy market, you know, you're looking more at the three to six, four to six months of supply, meaning it more it's it's more balanced for buyers and sellers. This indicates that it's certainly still a seller's market at the state level. Now, if you go to your market, similar pattern, but just uh, tighter. One and a half months of supply 
probably feels less than that, to be honest. Uh, you know, if you look out there, uh, but not a lot of improvement in the inventory. And uh, so those two factors that we talked about inventory and interest rates, not a lot of improvement in the inventory yet and a little bit of improvement in the interest rates. And what this has translated to is pretty much a, a flat start to 2024. The number of sales we've had so far statewide uh, is about 12,300 and a little bit better than we, where we were last year, but certainly much lower than where we were you know, even 2018 or 19, I don't like to compare to 21 and 22 because those were really just anomalies. You know, we had the interest rates so, so low. Uh, people had a lot of built up savings from lockdown, the lockdown period, and it was just a frenzy. So I really do like to compare it more to 2018, even before that, 2016, 17, to get more of a an a, a appropriate average. And we're still below it. We're still below the average starting uh, so far. Now that could change. I know we've seen a bit of bit of uptick in some of the showings. You know, uh, things that we track um, with uh, our our friends over at uh, Bright MLS. But you know, we're not really seeing this translate to sales yet. So, uh, in your market, very similar situation. A little bit better than last year, but really, it's sort of flat. So it's, uh, you know, we'll see what happens when we get our March data, which will be April, mid-April, we'll have the March data, we'll have the whole quarter, first quarter, so we'll have a better picture of where things could be going. But so far, a slow start to the 2024 market. Now, if we drill down to the local level, you're going to see a bit more fluctuation, particularly in the smaller uh, transaction, small by transaction volume uh, places. Caroline has quite a few more sales. Fredericksburg's down just a little bit. We got King George, pretty big uptick. Orange County, relatively flat. And uh, Spotsylvania, a little bit of a slowdown. Not much, though. Flat in Stafford. And then Westmoreland is up. But uh, I'm not seeing anything that strikes me as like a surge or a plunge, you know, with this these these numbers. And again, this is year to date. So this is how much has occurred so far. Uh, how many sales have occurred so far? So those uh, those two factors we talked about, the inventory being constrained and the interest rates uh, are really putting upper pressure on home prices. Not the interest rates, but the inventory is putting upper pressure on home pricing. The demand is putting upper pressure on home pricing. And we have actually seen this accelerate. If you look at the the little green bars there, in 2023, uh, you know, we started to see evidence that price growth was slowing, you know, um, and then by the by the fall of 2023, that was out the window. It, it had re-accelerated. And we're, you know, we're back to like anywhere from three, four, six, seven, eight percent median growth at the state level, which is very strong. Because if you look at Drew like an average trend line, that would be more in the two, three, you know, two to three percent range. But uh, we're starting to see that accelerate, and prices are continue to climb, and that's really due to the tight uh, inventory that we have and the strong demand that's out there. If you look at the local level again, we're going to see some a little bit of volatility in the the smaller markets, but pretty consistent. I mean, most places prices are still climbing um, or they're relatively flat. We're not seeing a big drop off uh, in most places. You know, Spotsylvania, 6%. That's, that is very strong um, growth uh, when, you, when you're talking about a median price. A little bit flat in Stafford there and, and then Westmoreland is inched up uh, from last year, but things are still climbing and that indicates that there's upward pressure, not downward pressure on home prices. And what this is making for is a continuation of uh, really com competitive market conditions. We continue to see sellers basically get their asking price. And this is on average. There's a lot of sellers that are still getting over their asking, depending on which market you're in and depending on the home. But uh, this, this reflects uh, the competitiveness, really, that's still out there, even though we're at a slow kind of transaction 
volume level. Uh, pretty slow, but it's still competitive. And that's also occurring in your market as well. If you look at the average sold to list price ratio in the Fredericksburg market, pretty close to about 100, 100%, a little, little below, but um, it's uh, it's still pretty incredible how how competitive it is. And um, that's also reflected in how fast homes are selling. They're still selling about two weeks in Virginia. This is the median. Um, <clears throat> so in your market, about 17 days, uh, which is pretty unique that we see that, you know, go down uh, that much, even though sales really haven't, uh, haven't budged too much. So it's, um, it's really, it's really competitive, uh, for buyers right now. All right. Crystal ball time. So we put these forecasts out in, at our convention every year. And we, you know, as the data comes in, we adjust them. Yeah, you know, as as market conditions are uh, unfold, uh, as the economy unfolds, for, you know, each month, and we get more information, and you kind of refine them, and so we still are of the thought that we're going to have more sales in 2024 than we had in 2023, about 11.4 percent more, and this is statewide. We do our projections statewide. We don't do regional projections, but when you start to, you know. For context, this is about 11,000, 11, give or take, uh, additional sales in 24 than we had in 23. <clears throat> now, this could certainly change. Uh, and our, uh, you know, our outlook for interest rates, you know, has gotten a little bit worse than than it was in September when when these when the initial batch of forecasts were produced. So it is tr it is possible that if the interest rates remain elevated and are not turning down as fast as projected, it could deter some at some additional activity of sales. So we could see fewer than 11%. But right now, uh, you know, 2023 was the slowest market that we had in over a decade. And so we are, you know, outpacing that uh, probably would not be that difficult. Uh, but it's really the, you know, it's still below average. Like if this 11% puts our, our total number of sales below average, but, uh, you know, certainly better than we were last year. Pricing, we are expecting it to continue to rise. And this is state level median. This is a, a metric, a forecast metric that we actually did recalibrate and uh, we uh, increased it uh, from where we were in the first vintage of the forecasts. And that's because we've seen that reacceleration of price growth since September. So we are projecting, uh, our research team is projecting 3.6% uh, median sales price. And this is the, the annual. So this is the entire year of 2024 compared to 2023, which is, you know, it's in line with kind of a average annual uh, price growth, but really it's just that lack of inventory. Uh, that's going to continue to put that upper pressure. And, uh, you know, there will be some markets where we might see a little bit of correction, um, primarily markets where you had an unusual influx of demand. Think your second home markets, places like that. Uh, but we are not seeing evidence of of this occurring in most places in Virginia. It's uh, prices are still going up. New construction, we are projecting the total number of starts. Now, this is everything, <clears throat> uh, all types of housing stock to go down from where it was in 2023. There is a bit of nuance to this that I want to I want to highlight, though. This does, it includes everything. So it, it includes apartments. It includes rental apartments. That's part of our housing stock. It's a very important part of our housing stock. And the rental market um, had a bit of a boom, construction boom, over the past couple of years, there's a lot of new units that came online in a lot of regions in Virginia. And so the builders, the developers are still building through that pipeline because each of these projects, you know, depending on their scale, can take anywhere from a year and a half to five years in some cases, depending on the, the size of the building and the complexity 
to finish. And so even if you're still seeing a lot of apartments being constructed, you know, because of that, that delay of that lag between start and finish, a lot of those projects were financed, you know, back when rates were very, very low. Uh, they were, uh, they were approved when the rental, there was a surge in rental demand. So as they build through that pipeline, what we're not seeing is projects coming behind it. So the pipeline is slowing down for multifamily. And because uh, just of the product type, a multifamily project is going to have a lot more units than a single family home project. So the reason why we're seeing an overall decline, projecting an overall decline of 3.5% is because we're we're expecting fewer apartments to be built. But when we look at the single family construction, we're actually projecting an increase in 2024 compared to 2023, about 6.5-ish uh, percent more. And that's, you know, that is helpful. We need inventory. We need builders to build more homes, uh, but it's certainly not, we're not going to build our way out of the shortage. So it's going to help but it's certainly not going to solve the 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 crunch that we have. And then lastly, everybody's favorites, uh, the mortgage rates, which are very, very difficult to predict um, because of how many factors, macro level factors influence them. But right now we're looking kind of quarter, six and a quarter by, by December. It's going to be very bumpy. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. You know, we're going to see periods, you know, just like February, for example, we had, you know, we had three months of training down in February, it changed, we had a rising every single week in February. And then now it's starting to trend back down. So it's going to be very bumpy. But if you just draw a trend line on it, um, the expectation is that it's going to have a downward slope. So where that lands is uh is yet to be seen uh i've seen projections a little bit higher than this i've seen projections a little bit lower than this but really it's the i think the the slope uh that is important and so we are going to continue to monitor it and, and we'll update these you know as we get new information but looking at like kind of the mid lower mid six ranges for this is for a 30 year fixed uh by december with that, here are some uh, resources for you all. We have a podcast called Roof Lines. Be sure to check that out. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing um, Craig Tolson, who's the CEO of the Virginia Builders Association, for a, a podcast episode here in the coming weeks. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. He's going to we're going to talk through how the builders are feeling, sort of the sentiment out there in Virginia. Get some perspective on on how that's going, and hopefully you get some more inventory. But we'll. We'll see what he has to say. Uh, so check that out. And then we just did a webinar. Hopefully some of you guys were on the webinar. We did that yesterday. We do it every quarter called By the Numbers, where myself and our deputy chief uh, economist, Sage, will unpack uh, you know, a topic. Last Yesterday, it was kind of a market update. Sometimes we do, you know, we dive into more specific data like demographics or, you know, things like that. So be sure to check that out. And then we also have a lot of data for you data nerds out there uh, on our data, on our research page and a lot of uh, reports, market reports, things like that. And uh, with that, happy to take any questions that we have. If you need any information or any data or have a question, general question, feel free to reach out to our team. That is, there's our email and we monitor that email box and would be, would love to hear from you. Uh, so with that, happy to take any questions and thank you all. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or put your question in the chat. This was a very great update, Ryan. Thank you so much for sharing these insights with us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll give anyone a, a second to type in case they're typing it in real quick. Let's... It's okay if you don't have any. You can always email us, but... <laughs> I'm here if you guys want to if you guys want to chat about anything. Ryan, I have a question. Um, you were talking about the apartment. The building starts with apartments, and then the building starts with new homes. With homes, how far out does it take? Like, if they plan to build an apartment building five years ago, is it finished now, or how does that work? So I know it's hard to predict mm -hmm. the 
the numbers you're going to end up with. Yeah, it's uh, it is hard uh, to predict, but usually the the key trigger point is when they start the construction. So there is a lot of planning of buildings that never see the light of day. They go through years of designing um, entitlements, you know, going to the zoning board, getting rezonings, battling through opposition with the community. Um, and many of those that get approved, you know, either the financing changes or the the developer shifts to a different project. In a lot of cases, some of these developers do this, and this is more so, I think, in the Northern Virginia market, but a lot of these developers go through this entitlement process without any intention of actually building the property uh, because it what it does is it increases the value of that land. And so then they sell it to someone else for someone else to build it, basically. And so really that trigger point is when they start the construction and that's a signal that the financing is in order and that they they want to build the project that timeline usually takes it depend it really depends on the scale of the building but i haven't seen these things get done in less than a year and a half that's sort of the the fastest scenario it's usually a year and a half two years uh, something like that depending on the size have you guys seen um have you guys seen some new new apartments uh, start in your markets? Yes, yes, we have. Are they uh, are they finished? Or are they still under construction? I think I've most of them are of that are just new, um, just new. Mm -hmm. and a lot of talk of residential, uh, not apartments like homes uh, being built. So, but they're not; they haven't broken ground yet. Yeah, that's the key is getting them getting them to break ground. Um, and that's really, yeah, that can be that can be delayed by a number of factors. Uh, but usually once they start construction, you're looking at a year and a half to probably three years, maybe two, depending on the size. And that's for multifamily. We, that's for multifamily. Single family, much shorter, much shorter. We do have a unique um, apartment community being built on the on the grounds of the Spotsylvania Town Center. They tore down one of the four um, primary stores there, Sears, and they are now building what they're calling luxury apartments um, on part of the footprint where that Sears was. Those are not complete as far as I know, but they're getting close. How how long ago did they uh, was it when they started the construction? Do you know? I'd say it's been at least five years. Oh wow, <laughs> that that sounds like a pretty unique case. <laughs> Uh, there might have been some type of remediation involved with depending on the if it used to be an industrial area. A lot of times they do have extra steps that they have to go through before they can have people living on the land. But um, that would have five that years, would have been true in this case yeah. because mm -hmm. that Sears had an automotive division. So oh, yeah. car repairs and that kind of thing going on. Yeah, that'll certainly delay the the project. Yeah, there, there are externalities like that. You know, I I, I live up in Alexandria <laughs> and there was a, a project right on the, the river there at the waterfront. They uncovered like a very old ship, like a like hundreds of years old ship. Wow. And so they had to preserve it. And so that slowed down the, the construction as well, because you had to meticulously, you had to get the, you know, the anthropologists in there and kind of, uh, do a dig and kind of get that thing out of there and preserved and that, that slowed down the construction. But if you don't have those type of things, then yeah, you're looking year and a half to, to three years. So Ryan, we do have a question in the chat. The headlines on the NAR settlement all forecast it will lower the cost of housing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on this? You know, we're, we're all digesting uh, this information. Uh, I don't, I don't foresee uh, sales prices really, being impacted very much just because of the supply that the shortage of supply. Now it certainly could impact the, uh, you know, the cost of the transaction uh, for buyers in particular uh, for the worse, but in terms of it, sellers deciding, you know what, I can lower my price because 
I don't, I'm not going to pay that the commission fee. Uh, you know, the market's really going to bear out what the price, the appropriate price is. And based on the inventory conditions we have, I, you know, I don't see the housing um, prices correcting uh, that much, but it's all very new. And so we're going to have to see how the market adapts to it. But those are my initial thoughts on it. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. So, how are you guys? Yeah. Uh, I mean, how is your market going? If I could ask just kind of a general question, is it slower? Are you feeling a little more activity out there? Is it what? What are kind of the themes that your clients are talking about? For me, Ryan, it's very much in line with how the interest rates are going up or down. Um, probably from early January through late February, I had more buyers than I could deal with. And as the interest rates have ticked up, those buyers have decided to sit on the sidelines again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's uh, slow, but better compared to last year. Okay. Absolutely. Does it feel like a... Uh... A normal spring again spring market are we are we at that yet probably not <laughs> seeing lots of no's and the head shakes <laughs> That's <a> no. <laughs> not yet no so we'll we're gonna we'll see how it progresses but yeah we're seeing that all over the state uh really similar conditions i i am seeing a trend among our for lack of a better word older population um I'm working with several people who want to sell their home, but in order to do that, they have to buy something. And even though I educate and provide information how to protect them with uh, a home sale contingency and finding a home of choice and all of those kinds of things, they're too scared mm -hmm. of being homeless to take that action. And, and I get it. I mean, it's not anything I'm trying to force them to do. It's mm -hmm. part and parcel with going through the depression and all of those kinds of things and what they grew up with. And I don't have any answers for them, but I can tell you I'm seeing it as a trend that more and more of our older population are being forced out of housing with no mm -hmm. other options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is concerning. Uh, and we have seen the data, the data suggests that baby boomers and silent generation uh, are slow to slow to downsize. They're, they're staying in their homes. And that's one of the reasons is they don't have a lot of options. I will say though, that there has been a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, senior related housing constructed in Virginia, maybe not necessarily right there in your region. I'm, I'm sure there are some, uh, but I know there's quite a few in Charlottesville, in Loudoun, in the, you know, the uh, outer Hampton Roads, kind of the peninsula region where these are you know a lot of these are for sale properties they're 55 and older communities single level uh but there's just not enough of them and a lot of them are very expensive so that's the key um, the expense yeah yeah so there are options out there but again it's it's not going to meet everybody's needs and there's certainly not enough of them but it is a growing trend because there is a lot of this this uh, housing stock being produced or planned for so I have two comments here. The senior construction here seems to be so, so expensive, more luxury type things. Yeah. And, uh, agree. It's very expensive. Yeah, that's that's what we're seeing too. And to be honest, even, I mean, any new construction at this point appears to be more on the luxury end. You know, even the townhomes are bigger than what single family homes used to be. You know, it's uh, so it's, but it does loosen up the market. You know, if you have someone that's moving into a new construction home, and potentially freeing up a home that is not new construction. So, but yeah, it's uh, it is a problem. There's a huge affordability problem right now. Lynn says, "Bring back the Waltons without the depression." <laughs> uh, is that show still on TV? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good question. Surely somewhere. There's so many channels now. I'm seeing some head shakes. Yes, you can still watch it. <laughs> that is good to know. I got one more comment here that says um, family taking care of family, multi-generational mm -hmm. living. We're seeing a lot of that. 
Oh yeah, we're seeing an uptick in that in the data for sure. I'm working with two buyers now. Um, one is local to Fredericksburg. One is in the Manassas area. They're both looking for multi generational living situations. And in talking with several local builders in the area, both custom and production style, the zoning codes inhibit um, the building of multi generational style homes. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's something that we're hopefully we can get. You know, when I say we, I just mean collectively the housing industry uh, and the real estate industry to get to take a look at because it's it's a growing trend and it's a growing need. Uh, so maybe some adjustments are needed. PSF maybe loans also have their there. restrictions. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions, um, you've got Ryan's contact information. So thank you guys so much for having me. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your, your week. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.